Hello and greetings. Tonight's dose into the unusual and the unsettling is brought to you in the form of a curated list that we have put together for you titled The Top 5 Worst Deaths Caught on Live TV. We hope you find this intriguing. As the story goes, number 5. The Death of Allison Parker and Adam Ward. News reporter Allison Parker and photojournalist Adam Ward were fatally shot by 41 year old Vester Lee Flanagan II on August 26, 2015 while conducting a live television interview near Smith Mountain Lake in Manita. They were employees of WDBJ News in Roanoke, Virginia. On a normal afternoon, they were busy interviewing Vicki Gardner who was the executive director of the local Chamber of Commerce, when all three were attacked by a gunman. Allison Parker, age 24, and Adam Ward, age 27, died at the scene. While Gardner survived, the 41-year-old gunman and former reporter at WDBJ by the professional pseudonym of Bryce Williams fled. Bryce Williams had been fired in 2013 for disruptive conduct. After a five-hour manhunt, the gunman shot himself during a car chase with police officers and died later at a hospital. The shooting occurred at 6.46 a.m. Eastern Time in the middle of the segment, which was broadcast live on air during the morning news program and video of the incident showed Parker conducting the interview, when at least eight gunshots were heard, followed by screams. Ward's camera fell to the ground, briefly capturing the image of Flanagan holding a Glock 19, 9mm pistol. WDBJ production master control operators then switched back to morning anchor Kimberly McBroom at the station's news studio, seemingly confused by what had just happened. Parker and Ward died at the scene. Gardner was also shot, but she survived following surgery at Carillion Roanoke Memorial Hospital. 11. According to the state medical examiner's office, Parker died from gunshot wounds to her head and chest, while Ward died from shots to his head and torso. Gardner was shot in the back after she curled into a fetal position in an attempt to play dead. A total of 15 shots were fired. Staff in the WDBJ newsroom reviewed video of the incident from Ward's fallen camera and identified Flanagan as the likely gunman. They alerted General Manager Jeffrey Marks, who passed the information to the county sheriff. Flanagan faxed ABC News at 8.23 a.m. and then phoned shortly after 10 a.m., making a confession. During the ensuing manhunt, authorities tracked Flanagan's cell phone to locate him. Flanagan abandoned his Ford Mustang at the Ronan of Blacksburg Regional Airport and drove a rented Chevrolet Sonic North on I-81, then east on I-66. An automated license plate reader in a Virginia State Trooper's car identified the rented Sonic at 11.20 a.m. The trooper called for backup and attempted to initiate a traffic stop, but Flanagan sped away. His car ran off the side of the road and struck an embankment near Markham after a pursuit of less than two miles. He was found inside the car with gunshot wounds which were apparently self-inflicted while he was driving. He was airlifted to Inova Fairfax Hospital in Falls Church, where he was declared dead at 1.26 p.m. Number 4. Jordan Romero Commits Suicide Live on TV During a live airing of Studio B, now retitled Shepard Smith Reporting, on Fox, news helicopters followed the high-speed chase between Arizona Highway Patrolman and Jordan F. Romero, who had stolen a car. At first it seemed like your normal car chase, Bad guy driving. Good guys chasing. However, things took a very dark and heinous turn when Romero swerved off onto a dirt road. He exited his vehicle before he desperately ran a few paces into the brush. All the while Shepard Smith the reporter expressed his unsettling discomfort. Even saying aloud several times I don't know about this. Yeah I don't know he seems a little chaotic. Yet through this the cameras rolled on. Then Romero stopped running. Romero then pulled a 45 caliber pistol from his waistband pressed the barrel to his temple and then shot himself in the head on live television for millions to see. In the background you can hear Shepard the reporter yelling get off it, get off it, get off IT, referring to live feed. All of which was too late. The video, despite being on a delay still broadcasted the live suicide. After a commercial break, Smith apologized for the graphic imagery. Fox News was later sued for airing the suicide on live air. Number 3. Daniel Victor Jones' Suicide on the Los Angeles Freeway Daniel Victor Jones was an American man who committed suicide on a Los Angeles freeway in 1998. The incident was broadcast on live television by news helicopters. Jones committed suicide as a form of protest towards health maintenance organizations after he had been diagnosed as HIV positive several months earlier. He worked as a maintenance worker and lived in a small two-bedroom bungalow off an alleyway in Long Beach alone with his pet dog Gladys. Gladys was a seven-year-old Labrador Whippet mixed breed. By April 1998 Jones was suffering from both HIV and cancer. His neighbors and fellow workers were unaware that he had any health problems. 
Jones confided to a friend in early April that he had found a flesh-colored growth on his neck confirmed to be cancer. By the end of April 1998, Jones believed he was going to die and so he decided to take his own life in a way that would draw publicity to his situation. Jones would later be quoted as saying, I'm not happy with what's happening to my situation and I'm going to draw attention to it whichever way I can. My paramount goal is for no one other than myself to get hurt. On Thursday, April 30, 1998, Around 3 p.m., 40-year-old Daniel Jones parked his dark gray Toyota pickup truck on the transition loop from the Harbor Freeway to the Century Freeway in Los Angeles. Jones sat in the front of his truck with Gladys. He began pointing a loaded shotgun at passing cars on the freeway, causing motorists to report him to the police. Jones himself then called 911, revealing he was emotionally distraught and that he was in pain. He complained that it would take him a month to schedule an appointment with a doctor and another month to get the results of a test. During the call, he fired off several rounds from his shotgun, with one of them going through the roof of his truck. Authorities then closed the two freeways, preventing anyone from approaching him. Jones remained in his truck the entire time, as police and news helicopters monitored his movements. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Special Weapons Team began to assemble and got into position around him. Jones then reached into a backpack he owned and took out clothing and a videotape. He then began throwing the items over the freeway wall. Afterwards, he got out of the truck and walked across the empty freeway. Jones then unfurled a large, square banner with white hand lettering that read, HMOs are in it for the money. Live free, love safe or die. Jones had made the banner specifically for the occasion and displayed it for the news helicopters to see. As it was pretty windy on the interstate at the time, Jones weighted the banner down with a container to stop it blowing away. Jones continued to make obscene gestures and returned to his truck several times to pet Gladys. As authorities prepared to negotiate with him, Jones suddenly returned to his truck and sat in the front seat. Intending to take his own life, Jones ignited a Molotov cocktail inside his truck. The vehicle suddenly burst into flames and was set ablaze. Jones got out of the vehicle however and ran across the freeway as he was engulfed in flames and smoke, with his hair, pants and socks all on fire. Jones tried to pat out the flames and managed to peel off his pants. He then continued to wander about looking dazed and disoriented, he walked to the edge of the freeway gesturing angrily. It appeared as if he was about to jump off the freeway. However, he changed his mind and backed away from the edge before returning to his ablaze truck. Moments later, at around 3.50 p.m., he retrieved his shotgun from the back of the truck and he placed the shotgun beneath his chin, pulled the trigger and in a very bloody and graphic display ended his life. He then fell to the ground with the camera still rolling and playing the event live to viewers watching at home. As it was a Thursday afternoon, it was witnessed by many children, whose after-school cartoons had been interrupted to broadcast the incident. Number 2 Comedian Thomas Frederick Cooper has heart attack live on air. Thomas Frederick Cooper was a British prop comedian and magician. As an entertainer, his appearance was large and lumbering at 6 feet 4 inches and he habitually wore a red fez when performing. He was notorious for working in failed magic attempts into his comedy routine. The irony of these cheap laughs would later lead to a tragic and morbid final few moments of his life, as audience members laughed and chuckled amongst themselves unknowingly watching him take his final breath on live television. You see, by the end of the 1970s, Cooper slipped into heavy smoking and drinking, which affected his career and his health. On the night of April 15, 1984 his routine at Her Majesty's Theatre in Westminster, London started out seemingly normal. But, upon closer look you can tell something wasn't right from the get-go. Visibly uncomfortable Cooper starts off his routine, visibly and audibly struggling to breathe. He begins his routine. And then he slowly collapsed from a heart attack in front of millions of television viewers. An assistant had helped him put on a cloak for his sketch, while Jimmy Tarbuck, the host, was hiding behind the curtain waiting to pass him different props that he would then appear to pull from inside his gown. The assistant smiled at him as he slumped down, believing that it was part of the act. Likewise, the audience gave uproarious laughter as he fell backwards, gasping for air. At this point Alistair Macmillan, the director of the television production, cued the orchestra to play music for an unscripted commercial break. Tarbuck's manager tried to pull Cooper back through the curtains. It was decided to continue with the show. Dustin G. and Les Dennis were the act that had to follow Cooper, and other stars proceeded to present their acts in the limited space in front of the stage. While the show continued efforts were being made backstage to revive Cooper, not made any easier by the darkness. It was not until a second commercial break that paramedics moved his body to Westminster Hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival. Number 1 Politician Bud Dwyer commits suicide in a crowded room on live TV. 
Robert Bud Dwyer was an American politician who served as the 30th state treasurer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. In the early 1980s, Pennsylvania discovered its state workers had overpaid federal taxes due to errors in state withholding prior to Dwyer's administration. A multi-million dollar recovery contract was required to determine the compensation to be given to each employee. In 1986, Dwyer was convicted for accepting a bribe from the California firm that won the contract. He was found guilty on 11 counts of conspiracy, mail fraud, perjury, and interstate transportation in aid of racketeering, and was scheduled to be sentenced on January 23, 1987. On January 22, Dwyer called a news conference in the Pennsylvania state capital of Harrisburg. What happened next was one of the most gruesome and heinous things ever captured. Throughout Dwyer's trial and after his conviction, Dwyer maintained that he was not guilty of the charges for which he was convicted, and that his conviction resulted from political persecution. Appearing nervous and agitated, he again professed his innocence and began reading from a 21-page prepared text later described as a rambling polemic about the criminal justice system. Dwyer spotted this and interrupted himself to say, those of you who are putting your cameras away, I think you ought to stay because we're not, we're not finished yet. Upon reaching the final page of his statement, which had not been distributed to the press nor press secretary Horshock in advance, Dwyer paused. And I'm on the last page now, and I don't have enough to pass out, but Duke, I'll leave this here, and you can make copies for the people, there's a few extra copies here right now. After deciding to break from his speech, Dwyer called to three of his staffers, giving each a sealed envelope with the insignia of the Treasury Department. After he had finished speaking and handing out the notes to his staffers, Dwyer then produced a manila envelope with a revolver in it. When the crowd in the room saw what Dwyer had pulled out of the envelope, the mood changed immediately from one of waiting to see whether he would resign his office to one of panic as nobody knew what he was planning to do with the gun. People gasped, and Dwyer backed up against the wall, holding the weapon close to his body. Dwyer calmly stated to his audience, please, please leave the room if this will, if this will affect you. Dwyer quickly fired one shot through the roof of his mouth and into his brain, and collapsed to the floor dead. Five news cameras recorded the events. One of the cameras remained focused on Dwyer and captured close-up footage of the aftermath of the shooting. As his body slumped, blood streamed from the exit wound in the back of his head as well as from his nostrils and mouth. Horshock took the podium and asked the media to leave and for someone to call for medical assistance and the police. Dwyer died instantly from the gunshot shortly before 11 a.m. EST but was not pronounced dead until 11.31 a.m. An aide later stated that Dwyer's corneas were made available for transplant per his organ donation wishes, but that no other organs were usable by the time his body reached a hospital. We hope you found this presentation to be quite unusual and unsettling. Be sure to follow us and subscribe. Also, feel free to share with other like-minded individuals such as yourself. As for tonight's episode, we bid thee a farewell.